Everybody, thanks for watching. So I'm gonna get right into this. It's very important, a lot of information to get into. So for years, I've been talking about universal law and I've been talking about how the powers that be have to operate under universal law. So if you don't know anything about astrology, if you don't study the planets and you know what the constellations are all, all about, then you're gonna have to take my word for it and fact check later, but it's a lot of information, so I'm gonna get right into it. So understand for argument's sake, if you wanna do anything on this planet and you want it to work, if you wanna do anything on this planet that's gonna evolve or involve the collective energy of the planet, then you have to do so under universal law. So again, universal law, what is that? Universal law is you operating within the law of the universe involving the energies of the planet, the stars, the sun, and the moon, plain and simple. So if you're into astrology, then you understand different planets have different energies. You read horoscopes and talk about what this planet does, so on and so forth. We'll get into that. So in order for you to operate under universal law, you have to operate under the energy that the planets that are in your house involves. So understand like when you are in a certain house, there are planets in that house. Those planets have different energies that are basically available to you while you are in that house. So you will be affected by the energies of this planet, everybody in a different way based upon your astrological sign or based upon your consciousness, if you understand, because understand no matter what, your consciousness will trump all if you understand the energies and you know how to act accordingly. So understand, again, in order for you to do anything, involving the collective energy of this planet and having any type of success in what you are trying to do, you can only operate within universal law using the energies that is provided to you during a certain time or age involving the sun, the moon, the stars, well, the constellations, and the different planets, okay? So understand that. So I want you to think about um, you know, the ancients, the ancestors, and how when we go back and look, we find so many different, uh, you know, carvings of the stars. We find stuff about the planets. They worship the sun, the moon, different constellations. The Bible talks about the heavens being in space. It talks about the heavens being, you know, above. Everything is about space. Everything is about the heavens. So you have to look at the fact that the Egyptians align the pyramids with the stars on Orion's belt. We have to look at the seven churches that's in Turkey that aligns with the stars, the seven stars in the Pleiades. We have to look at all of these structures around the world that are aligned with constellations, planets, stars, the sun, the moon, so on and so forth. Everything when you go back in antiquity and look has to do with space. Plain and simple. There's no way around that. When you when you look at uh Ancient Egypt, when you look at the uh, Greek uh, mythology, the Greek culture, remember, you, we're talking about Saturn, we're talking about all the moons of Saturn being Greek gods and everything is involving the planet. The whole story about Zeus and Jupiter, everything is involving planets. And it's for a very, very important reason because this is true energy. This is powers. Now, again, this is gonna be weird and, and sound spooky to some of you, but it's gonna make a lot of sense. You know how I do videos. So understand that part first. Everything was about the planets and they grasped the concept that in order for you to have any type of success, you have to act during certain planets corresponding in the house you are in, meaning in the constellation you are in or in the planetary, uh, let's say, alignment with earth you are in and the energies that they provide so understand we have holidays festivals once a year every year to celebrate certain things and this is what the ancients did as well they have festivals they have holidays to celebrate certain things because back then they understood there is some kind of energy that you can get from this and you got to think about it today we look at it today things like christmas and these other holidays are simply symbolic to us we dress up, we do whatever as a symbolic gesture uh, to the holiday. But back then it wasn't such a thing. You know, you wasn't putting on a costume to impress people or, to, or you know, give people a laugh. They did this stuff because they understood there was real energy behind it. When we go back and look at the ancients, 
When we look at the powers that be during ancient times, all the wars they fought from, you know, Kemet all the way up until, you know, taking control of America, they won those wars, you know, up until that point in time. So all the ancient wars we look at, they fought them, they won, they conquered so many different civilizations and they were able to do so because they followed universal law. They followed the Zodiac, plain and simple. So the Zodiac is the key to universal law. The Zodiac has the houses of God. The Bible always talks about the house of God, things in God's house, so on and so forth. And, you know, my house has many mansions. This is about the houses that's on the cross of the Zodiac. Each house has a different constellation. It represents a different uh, astrological sign and different plants will come in different houses and provide different energies to different people. And you have uh, a choice as a collective to tap into that energy. So understand, and, and this will make, make sense. If you are at the head or controlling the collective energy on the planet, then you can decide whether the energy that you siphon from these planets or this planetary or universal energy is gonna to go towards something good or bad. That is what it's about. It's about choice, duality. So again, the Bible, as I said, it's all about duality. It's about choice and making a choice. So it's going to be whoever is ruling is going to decide because we are all in a contract, in an agreement, and we are all agreeing to be under this government, these powers that be. We have given our energy to them without even really knowing. And there's only certain ways you can take energy back and it's why they seem to always be winning at every step because we are basically agreeing to let them represent us as an energy. So they are deciding how the energy is going to be used and they have been using it in their favor for you know generations. So when you understand that, and again, as I said, it's going to sound a little, spooky, a little bit spooky at first, but it's going to make sense. They are taking control of the collective energy that is provided to this planet for many different things and they have been using it to build what they have built. So now, of course, we take it to the Bible because the Bible is the key to all of this. It's giving you everything, as I always say, it is giving you the answers. And we're gonna start with Moses. Moses represents Aries, he represents Aries. Aries the ram. We see statues of Moses with the ram's horns holding the Ten Commandments. We know the ram represents Judaism. We see um, that the Jews blow the shofar. And Moses represents Aries. And we know that Aries is Mars. You know, Aries in Greek is the god of war and is represented by Mars. Mars represents war. So understand that. So Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt. And of course, it's all a metaphorical story. And, you know, he gave them the laws, you know, remember, the Israelites went out, they went to war, they went conquering everybody, beating everybody, winning all those wars. But before that, Moses had to give them the laws. Now, these are basic laws of man, and these are laws of God. Now, a lot of the laws in the Ten Commandments is basic stuff, thou shalt not kill still, this easy stuff we can remember. There are other laws that are laws of God that are different. So you gotta remember what was taking place during this time and the symbology, some of you guys may know, but I'm gonna break it down real quick for those who don't because it's really important to understand what this stuff is really talking about. Now remember, Moses came down from the mountain and basically God told him to go down there because the Israelites was worshiping a different God. He goes down there and he sees them worshiping the bull calf and he breaks you know, the Ten Commandments, the tablets. So, you know, what was that about? Now it says here, Exodus 32, one through four. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, up, make us gods, which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become of him. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings, which are in the ear of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. Now all the people break off the golden earrings, which were in their ears, 
and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. So the last part of that is the clue. You know, how would Aaron know what gods brought them out of Egypt? You know, he didn't see uh, the God that brought him out of Egypt. He just said, here's a bull, worship this. You also have to think about why would the people want to worship something? Do you understand? So you have to think about, as I said before, they worship things. They understood they had to worship or basically channel the energy that was being presented, presented to them during that specific time in order to have success in whatever they was trying to do. So you had these people that's coming out of Egypt or these people that's wandering, basically, you know, trying to start a civilization and they understand unless they call on the energy that's available to them, which would be the God during this time, they are not going to have success in what they are trying to do. So understand what it's, what it's trying to say. That key is him saying that that's the God that brought him out of Egypt. So you have, you know, Moses come down and sees what and sees what happened, and again he breaks the law. The key to this is the very first law. The first law that God gives is you shall not have any other gods before me. Not that you shouldn't kill or steal, do not have any other gods before me. You understand? That is that is the key. But think about it. How could it be any other gods before God? If this is the one true God, what God is before you? What are you talking about? If it's a God before you, then isn't that God? Isn't that God over you? So why would God give a law that's saying you shouldn't worship any gods before me? So that is the key. So when you understand what's being said, it's talking about, of course, the Zodiac. Aaron tells them, this is the God that brought you out of Egypt. And as I said, Moses represents Aries. So you guys understand one, when they got to Mount Sinai, that represents the coming of the age of Aries. The age that they just left is called the Exodus. They were exiting, not just Egypt, but exiting the age of Taurus the bull. So when Aaron says, this is the God that brought you out of Egypt, he's talking about the bull, Taurus the bull, a constellation. You understand? So when God, the first commandment he says is, do not worship any gods before me. The God before him would be Taurus. So you got to understand one, that when we're talking about the Zodiac, when we're talking about which would be the heavens and so on and so forth, the planets, those are gods. They're all gods. We understand this as well. In Greek mythology, all the planets was gods. They all have powers and so on and so forth. They are all gods. This is what it's talking about. So you got to think about it. Do not have any gods before me. The reason why this is the most important and number one uh, commandment is because you will not have any power worshiping any god before the god that's in the house that you are in. Understand? So they are now in the house of Aries. The planets that are, that are in Aries during this time or the constellations that are in Aries or stars and so on and so forth that are in Aries or in that house at that time is the power they can draw from. They could draw energy only from those. If you draw energy from any other planets or anything else before what's there, you will not have any success. So they wanted to make that important for you to understand. So important that God wrote on some tablets and you know Moses broke them. I mean, just think about that. It's trying to stress how important it is to not be in uh, worshiping the constellations or the energies that's before you because that's breaking universal law or the law of God. So easy to understand when you understand astrology. So you have to think about it. You have, this was Taurus the bull. They are in Taurus when we get the Hebrews. When the Israelites come out and they're on their way to starting, they are in Taurus. So you guys seen, uh, you know, bull fights where they say Toro. This is where they get the Torah. The bull is the, talking about the start, the beginning of Judaism for the Hebrew. So, Toro, Taurus, Torah, all same thing. So, you have the Hebrews getting this knowledge from Moses, and now they have the understanding that one, 
we have to follow these certain rules, which they're giving you the hint they already knew because they wanted to worship something. Just think about that. They just came out of there. They want to worship this God. You know, if the God, you see Moses part to see. So obviously they understood it's some kind of power here or something going on. So they wanted to know what it was. They wanted to know what was giving them favor during this time. And hey, Aaron, you his man, you know, give us the God that we're supposed to be worshiping so we can have success in what we are doing. So Moses breaks the tablet. We know the tablets go in the Ark of the Covenant. Remember, as I said, they were going around and beating everybody because they had the Ark of the Covenant. That was the source of their power. Now, as I said, you can only access certain power during certain times and ages, which they were in the age of Aries, and they were able to win because they was worshiping the power of the time or age they were in. So big key is the Ark of the Covenant. Now, on top of the Ark, you have the two cherubims. And we know God spoke to them from the ark, from between those two cherubims. Every time he spoke, it was clouds and lightning and thunder and so on and so forth that appeared. Now, they're giving you a description of, you know, the ark in the Bible. But you have to understand, you know, argument's sake, the two cherubims represents the stars, represents the stars. Remember, Ezekiel, he had a vision about these cherubims. And you have to understand what it's talking about esoterically. So it says here, okay, so it's the previous post, well, explore the stacks of evidence which suggests that the vision of Ezekiel, one of the most important and most argued over passages of ancient Hebrew scripture in which the prophet describes a whirlwind from the north and wheels within wheels and the likeness of four living creatures out of the midst of them is in fact an esoteric description of the awesome celestial machinery which turns the heavens throughout the year and that those four likenesses correspond to the zodiac sign governing the points of the two solstices, summer and winter, and the two equinoxes, spring and fall. I'm gonna skip here, it says, however, in the 10th chapter of Ezekiel, the scripture text uses a different term to describe the subjects of this vision. In addition to talking about likenesses, the text reintroduces them, but this time in the midst of much description of cherubim or cherubims in the Geneva 1599 or King James uh, 1611 translations, while still referring to the four faces and turning wheels. Now, however, there are several verses referring to the carrying of burning coals and the hand mainly in the hands of the cherubim's hands, which they are described as having under their wings. But again, this is referring to the stars. The cherubim's represent stars. We're gonna, we're gonna make that point in a second. But understand, remember, Genesis 1.14 says, and God said, let there be lights in the firmament. Understand, lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. This is astrology is talking about clear as day. This is what they are supposed to follow. This is all important as leading up to everything. Just, you know, be patient. So now we all know we find the ark or the real ark in Kemet. So we find where they stole the design for the ark of the covenant in Kemet. But on top of that ark, we see Anubis, and Anubis is the key. So they're giving you, they specifically made sure they mention the description of the Ark of the Covenant and what's on top, being the cherubims. So when we go to Kemet and we see that ark, but we don't see cherubims on top, naturally Anubis is the key. So now Anubis is the dog star. Anubis represents the dog star. He represents uh, Canis Major, Canis Minor. So there's only one thing in that area that fits exactly Ezekiel's vision, and it's called Procyon. Procyon is a star or a sun that is bigger than our sun. And when you look at it at certain times, it looks like it has spinning wheels. It is the only thing that fits Ezekiel's vision, but they are giving you that clue to show you that 
when it's talking about cherubims, because they re related it to the cherubims, it's talking about stars. It's important. So, as I said, they talked about, they described these wheels. Now, it's a company called Procyon. They manufacture synthetic uh, rubber bonded wheels. So God talks to them from the top of the Ark of the Covenant. And as I said, every time he talks, there's thunder and lightning and everything like that. Clouds appear. And as I just said, the cherubims represent stars. So when he's giving you the description of the Ark of the Covenant and how the tabernacle, remember, it's told him to build this tabernacle and this is, that's where it's going to be housed at. And um, when they give you the, the description, uh, it says here, this is Exodus 26, 1. It says, Moreover, thou shalt make the tabernacle with ten curtains of fine twined linen, and blue, and purple, and scarlet, with cherubims of cunning work shalt thou make them. Now understand, when you see the pictures, these depictions of the tabernacle, and look at the sky, those are the colors. Those colors, the purple, the scarlet, the blue, the colors that it talks about represents the colors of space, the colors of the sky. And when you couple that with the fact that we're talking about stars being the cherubims, it's telling you clear as day that the Ark of the Covenant represents the sky. It represents the Zodiac, plain and simple. That's what it represents. The reason why they won is because they follow the Zodiac. And that's the, that's the key it's giving you. So you had the Hebrews walk around. As I said, they won all their battles. They fought as long as they followed the Zodiac, as long as they follow God's commandments, which were in the Ark of the Covenant. And as long as they had the Ark of the Covenant, they won. They won the wars. So here's what you got to think about. You have the Hebrews fighting, winning these wars, right? Let's go back real quick and think. You had the very first commandment, as I said, do not worship any gods before me. Moses broke the tablets when he found them doing that. So they will not get punished. There won't be no repercussions or anything as long as you're following those commandments, right? So it's showing you that it was so important for them not to break the first commandment, right? So, or any commandments, any laws of God. So if Moses was so pissed that they broke a commandment, came down and they broke a commandment, that he broke the tablets that God wrote on. Think about that. That's trying to really emphasize how important it is not to break that one, but don't break any laws of God. So they were winning because they wasn't breaking any laws. So think about it. <laughs> they're going around, they're winning all these wars, right? What are the other commandments that's on a tablet? Don't kill, don't steal. If you follow my Bible series, you understand exactly what they were doing. They were going out with the Ark of the Covenant, breaking every single law on the Ark, except for the first law. Remember, they had the Ark, they was going into civilizations, they was killing those people, murdering kids, and taking everything they had and dividing it up amongst each other. So they were breaking God's commandments, but why didn't they get punished? Because they were doing it under universal law. Plain and simple, they were doing it while carrying the Ark of the Covenant, which the Ark of the Covenant represents the Zodiac, which represents the power they were under during that time. And you can use that power to do good or evil as long as you do so under that power, which is under universal law. How is it they killing and murdering kids? You see how it makes sense now? Because they were under universal law. I told you guys before. There's universal law and there's man's law. A lion can go out and kill a baby buffalo right in front of his mom. It's not gonna be no police that's gonna come and arrest that lion. That's nature, we say, but that's universal law. They're going out and killing and murdering. And we're saying they're doing so in the name of God. They're doing so because God said they could do so. God is the zodiac, God is universal law, and all things are possible under universal law as long as you abide by those laws. So because they had the Zodiac or the Ark of the Covenant, they were able to go out and do what they were doing and conquer and win those wars because they were following universal law. Remember, every time they got punished, every time they got conquered or killed, what, they did, what did they do? It, it was because they was worshiping other gods. Every time. It wasn't because they was killing. 
So it wasn't because they were stealing. It was because they were worshiping other gods. Whenever God came down there or sent somebody uh, to conquer them or what have you, it's because they were worshiping other gods, breaking that first commandment, which is using things outside of your power, the energy that's provided for you, worshiping other gods. So you think about it. All the other people that they was going out and killing uh, in the Bible was because what? They was worshiping other gods. And they were able to beat them because they wasn't using the power that was available to them during that time because either they didn't have the knowledge of it or because they was worshiping the wrong energy at the wrong time or tapping into the wrong energy at the wrong time for whatever reason. But it's giving you that understanding that that is what it was. You got to go back and think about wow, why people would want to worship something uh, just you know out of the blue. Like we need to worship something now. Give us something. And, you know, we're trying to start a civilization here. We need to understand what power is available to us. Who's the God that's available? Who's the God that's here? Who's the God that's in our house that we can draw this energy from? And he gave him Taurus, but he was wrong. It was Aries. But it's just, as I said, a hint to telling you what this is all about. So another story, Constantine. And this is the same story that they're trying to give you with the inception of Christianity. We're talking about before the inception of Judaism, beginning with this story in Exodus that's trying to give you the Zodiac and tell you that the power is in the Zodiac and God is the Zodiac when you try to understand. So you have Constantine, remember, broke this whole thing down in my ancient history series. Constantine, who was a pagan, who basically, nothing wrong with being pagan, by the way. <laughs> uh, he basically said that, you know, he went to sleep, Jesus came to him and told him to use this sign to basically win the battle. So he had a battle for who was going to be leading Rome, and it was between him and I think it was Antipater. Um, so he put that sign on the shield of his army, and they won the battle of Milvian Bridge because he put that sign that Jesus told him to put on his shield. And you guys know this is the sign that he put on there. So you got to understand, one, this is an ancient pagan symbol, plain and simple, that represents the Zodiac. That's what it's about. It's the Zodiac. Now it says here, it's the Chiro. So we'll go down here. It says, before it became the monogram of Christ, the Chiro was the monogram of Kronos, the god of time, and an emblem for several solar deities. Chiro is also the origin of the tradition of abbreviating Christ and Christian and Christmas to X. The small letter and the image are the Alpha and Omega. So we know God is the sun. Plain and simple, one of the powers, the main power of the Zodiac. We have the disciples of Jesus represented by the 12 signs of the Zodiac. You know, this power is talking about all of this astrology as they've been saying to us for a long time, but a lot of people understood, but we didn't see or we didn't know that these things correspond to real actual things and events that I'm going to get into. And that, you know, this is real stuff right here. And when you understand how they correspond with major events and things that happen in our history, you'll understand. But it's talking about, you know, the Zodiac. And it's giving you so many different clues in the Bible that God is the zodiac, that God is the sun, and so on and so forth, and that the power is in that zodiac. So we look here. This is Psalms 19, 5 through 11. It bursts forth like a radiant bridegroom after his wedding. It rejoices like a great athlete eager to run the race. The sun rises at one end of the heavens and follows its course to the other end. Nothing can hide from its heat. The instructions of the Lord are perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The commandments of the Lord are right, bringing joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are clear, giving insight for living. Reverence for the Lord is pure, lasting forever. The laws of the Lord are true, each one is fair. They are more desirable than gold, 
even the finest gold. They are sweeter than honey, even honey dripping from the comb. They are a warning to your servant, a great reward for those who obey them. Job 38, 31 to 32, it says, can't thou bind? And this is when he's talking to Job, basically cussing him out, saying, can you do this? So it says, can't thou bind the sweet influences of Pleiades? That's a star system. Or lose the bands of Orion, a star system. Can't thou bring forth Mazaroth in his season? And Mazaroth is the zodiac. Or can't thou guide Arcturus with his sons? Which Arcturus is this. If you go to the ESV version, it says Mazaroth, and it says, in their seasons, or can you guide the bear with its children? What is it talking about? It's talking about Ursa Major and Ursa Minor, which are the bear constellations, plain and simple. These are all constellations it's talking about. If it's God that's doing these things, it's talking about God in the zodiac, not God, this being. And it's giving you astrology, giving you the hint that this is the power, this is what it's talking about. So we see all throughout the Bible references to constellations, references to stars, planets, so on and so forth. Saturn is in the Bible. You have seen the Pleiades is in the Bible. It's talking about Orion in the Bible. It's talking about the sun and the moon. And everything is in there pointing you to astrology. Stuff that you guys understand by now, but it's important to understand what it's going to couple with that I'm going to show you guys in this video. So as I said, each planet has different powers, different aspects. And um, you guys who read horoscopes and stuff like that understand that it's giving you a lot of times what your day is going to be like based upon those planets and the power that it's putting out, the energy that it represents. And there's so many other things that come into play, degrees, position, uh, so on and so forth, the sun, the direction that it's in. There's a lot of stuff that comes into play. It's not easy to just read it based upon what somebody wrote you know, online. It's a lot of other things that come into play that will determine how those energies, energies will affect you. And if you understand this stuff and you know what energy is out there for you to tap into and how your day, year, whatever you're trying to do is going to go based upon those things. So I want to give you, as you can see floating through the screen here, uh, the different planets and what they represent. But I want to trigger on a few of them that I'm going to read real quick that is very important that we all need to understand. And that is Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Pluto. Pluto. 